welcome back to Along the Road. Here we are in Kingston, New Hampshire. Spring is upon us, and I'm Pastor Josh at First Congregational Church. And I'm Katie Johnson, the Children's Discipleship Director here at the church. And we love to gather with you every week and talk about our faith, talk about topics in our faith, how that intersects with our life, uh, and how we just take this journey along the road with us and, and see where God leads us. Uh, we are coming on our final, not even chapter anymore, conclusion of the book we've been going over. Yeah. Our final and episode. Episode for well for the book, for the for book, the book. For, for the, the book. book. Yes. We have more episodes to come. Yes, yes. Uh, but yes, we have been going through a book called Political Gospel by Patrick Schreiner. Um, very interesting book, in a lot of different ways. Uh, I think highlighting what politics could be, as opposed to the way we see it, and really highlighting a lot of the the church, early church, the beginning church, Christ Himself when He came. They were all political. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in the conclusion, but the, the book really helps drive this tension between that and the, the different versions that seem to be contrary. If we use the words submission and the word subversion, they seem to be contrary. Uh, you use the word, you know, the, the way of the lion and the way of the lamb, they seem to be contrary. And he shows how really they live in a tension. The conclusion does help us bring that out a little bit more. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from there. So we are on the conclusion, uh, obviously, in this book. Uh, you and I were just talking a little bit about it. Katie has some issues with it, mostly editing issues. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's editing issues. So we'll get to it. And I will say this, you know, um, as you're following along, Norm, as you talk to me, we may mention page numbers and your Kindle might be a little different, but I think you'll pick it up anyway. Uh, and you may not have the editing issues we have because he told me. Ah, we mentioned page numbers, but his Kindle uses different page numbers. Oh, sure. So he has to figure out where we are sometimes. So sorry about that if you're a Kindle reader. And I didn't, I didn't realize that. So that's just how it goes. So he brings in the conclusion with the title City of Man and City of God. And I would say, you know, Kingdom of Earth, Kingdom of Heaven. Mm -hmm. That's how I would say it. And so he begins back to the beginning, religion and politics, is one of those things that they say you don't talk about at family gatherings, you don't talk about it places. Uh, they're polarized. Because they're polarized. It's better to talk about who won the Super Bowl, what movies are coming out next, who won you know, a Grammy, or who, you know, those are things we can all talk about. Um, but underneath is the idea that these two spheres, religion and politics, are so different that we need to avoid them. Um, and he says the religion one is about our internal life, and politics is more about a public life. And so when we see it that way, uh, it's not a biblical view of how it was seen. Even the way Christ lived, it wasn't a biblical view. Both were public. Both were internal. And so even the gatherings of believers, in essence, were a political type of statement. And so he talks about that. He says the division that we have cannot be actualized between church and state. We may have a little bit of a division here in our American nation, Part of it established in some of our documents, and we don't want uh, the state telling the church how it's supposed to worship, or the church telling the state how they're supposed to govern, uh, unless we're voting. That's how you do it, by voting. Mm -hmm. um, but that idea of a separation of church and state was not around before America, <laughs> basically, uh, before the establishment of our documents, establishment of our governance. So for thousands of years, and it's still in many countries. Uh, still not around. He says, um, most of history did not divide the subjects. Politics and religion were not separated spheres, um, but they were more like uncomfortable bedfellows. You know, and the book, he said, has been an argument that Christianity is fully political. Uh, it has a political past, a political present, and a political future. And he lays that out. And we've seen that, you know, what it was like in the time of Christ, what it's like now, and the fact that Christ, who is king, will return and establish a new heaven, a new earth, a new kingdom. That's a type of politic. His governance will be final and for real for all, and that's a future of politic. So he said, we struggle with political discipleship. And that was a new word for us. Mm -hmm. uh, not the two words are new, but putting those together. Right. Right. <laughs> How that works out, what it means. And then he gets into the things we've talked about for all of these chapters, the paradoxes, mm -hmm. these tensions that we live in. Submission and subversion are are the undergirding of all the other paradoxes he talks mm -hmm. about. Um, so he calls submission as a reminder uh, the voluntary yield to the authority of another. And I thought that was interesting. And I I think I missed that when we first read it, or maybe I didn't remember it as well. The word voluntary is key. Mm. 
submission in this case, especially as a believer, is I voluntarily submit to the governing authorities. This is not submission as in someone is forcing you to do what you want. Like slavery like or slavery. concentration camps right. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so it does look different. We, we sacrifice our own desires and power for the common good. So we look at what the government is doing. And remember, the authority of the government is given by God himself. When used appropriately, they are supposed to do some of the works that God has commanded them to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you get into the tension side later where it's it not being used appropriately, you know, where you don't submit. So then he talks about the chart and where that is. Now, this is where your first editing issue runs into. Yeah. And like right. I said, I don't know if Norm's Kindle has it this way or not, but even me, I was looking at the chart and I said, something's not right. Because the chart he has is not for submission, it's for subversion. The chart is actually on the next page. He, I, I don't think it's his fault. No, I think it's the editor. It's probably some editor out there going, oh, yeah, that looks good enough. You know, we're in the conclusion. Hurry uh, up and finish. Hurry up and finish this. We have this. Yes. You know, and so, but it's just this, this idea that the government will not always treat those with less power with all fairness. So you kind of have this where the power is and how much reform we have. But, but it was interesting, that yeah. idea of, of it's not just linear, yeah. but there's two axes. Yes. Where So how much power you have depends on how you react. Yeah. And how that, much submission, how much self-sacrifice, how much self-yield, what you're giving uh, lays out in there as well. Right. And then, of course, the other approach is a subversion approach. Those are the two pieces. He said it's... Yeah. What's interesting is he said it's not unlike submission. We're prone to pit these two against each other, but he says they're you know they're bedfellows in some ways. The definition is to use your own words or actions to critique or undermine the usual way of doing something. So it's the other side of obedience. It is critique, challenge, disobedience, uh, and he he puts a caveat: disobedience to authorities, out of obedience to God. You know so. So if it is against what God has commanded us to do, that's one thing. Then we are disobeying authorities. Mm -hmm. If it's a preference or something else, or that, that, our, idea. or our ideas, you know, and the simplest is, you know, God has commanded us to respect the authorities, and and when I drive sixty five and fifty five, I am not submitting to that. But it's not subversion; it's just outright disobedience. Right. <laughs> you know, and so so to understand the difference between the yeah. two is very important. Subversion like submission, can be understood on two axes as well. And he has the same one, the power. But then there's the critique part and the reform part where we can go in, especially in our American nation, we can go in and reform. Right. And the more power you have, right. the more ability you have to reform. Right. When you don't have as much power, then you're left more on the critique side. Right. And so the early church didn't have any power to reform. No. The, they, they were thought of as... They, no, there was no voting. So they, they were... They were thought of as something with no power. He says the main approach on politics was in their in theirs was to subvert unjust systems, not by reform, not by overthrowing. Just and I wrote in my my little notes, just by being the church, mm -hmm. by advocating for the kingdom of God for what is to come, yeah. which is not Rome, nope. it's another kingdom, uh, while living in the kingdom of man. Mm -hmm. And so they advocate that by taking care of the poor, by reaching out to the orphans, by loving on people by doing the things that are right and speaking up or critiquing the things that are wrong. And so they are the church, you know, and, and that's how they do that. He says, um, at the same time, their new way of life didn't look for the city, uh, did not, uh, didn't only look for the city to come, but thought of the good of all humanity. So they weren't just thinking, here's the coming kingdom of God, but they're thinking, what can we do for the good of humanity while we are here? Because that doing of the good is what calls people unto Christ. Right. It's a gospel-oriented type of thing. Um, and then it kind of has this ripple effect in society and what it does. My, my favorite picture of that ripple effect is always in Ephesians, uh, where the believers, for the good of themselves and for others, stopped buying idols. And when they stopped buying idols, the craftspeople of the town became angry at the Christians just because they didn't buy. And they caused an entire riot in the town. It had a ripple effect. And in the riot and in, in the, the economic things, sector. Yeah, yeah. You, you can read that. And they were going to do things. But then the, the town 
mayor, selectman, whatever they want to call him, you know, he stopped her and said, hey, you know, this is one, it's not a proper right. You have no accusation against people who just stopped buying. Right. You know, but that was a political statement they were making. We are no longer worshiping these gods. We worship the one and only God, so we won't buy your stuff. Um, and it had a ripple effect. Why? Because they were just being the church, living according to God's purpose. And still, under the law, they were not required to buy. They were not required. <laughs> I think it's very interesting yeah, that, sure. that it does have that ripple effect. And what if we were the same way? Right. Well, and as a more recent example mm-hmm. would be uh, World War II and yeah. the people who hid the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't taking up arms against the Nazis. No. They just said, no, what you're doing is wrong, and so we're going to subvert by yeah, exactly. working against it. And so he, he kind of shows these things, and he says that the Christian, that the, the early church, their main task is the similar to our main task, and that is that we proclaim the new society, the new kingdom, which is brought on by the Spirit uh, and is manifested in the church. So we're just sitting here proclaiming the new kingdom to come. We say that all the time. That's actually part of our mission statement at, here at Kingston's Congregational Church. We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. In other words, we politically say Christ is king. And as king, he welcomes all to come to him for salvation. Um, But it's different in that our political situation is different because we have democracy. We can vote. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't live in a totalitarian state. So even the way we think about this book would be different in other nations today. Mm -hmm. You cannot think about this book the same way if you're a Russian citizen. You know, how you could critique the state could mean prison time or your life, just by critique. And that gets back to power, doesn't it? Yes. How much power, where are you in the power continuum? Yes, it does. It gets back to that as well. So he says all of this, these tensions and paradoxes, they come to meet at the cross. And I think that's why he has this dual axis, because he kind of puts them in an image together that makes a cross. Um, But submission and subversion is showcased there. These things that seem contradiction, he said they're not. He actually says the tension doesn't exist because they're, um, two kingdoms, uh, as some propose, or because the Bible refutes itself, as others assert. It exists because we stand at a moment of transition and a chronological tension. Christians stand between two ages. Political theology is so difficult because we live between two times. Um, the eschatology saying for this is we're in the already but not yet. <laughs> we're in the already. Christ is risen. Mm-hmm. And he's gone to heaven to prepare a place. So the king is here. Some people call it the inaugurated kingdom. You know, he, he is here, but he hasn't returned to take his his throne. It's the same idea that's going to happen this year in American politics with the lame duck session. We're going to have everything happen in November. We'll have within a, hopefully within a night or two, we'll know who all the elected officials are. But they don't start till January 6th. So you have this in-between time of how do you live, what do you do, uh, and in the government, it's a little different, but the church is dealing with the same thing. Christ has already won. He is in heaven, preparing a place for us. He has promised his return. So we are waiting for the city of God to come and not kind of overtake the city of man. It will replace the city of man or, or everything here. Mm-hmm. And so we live in this uh, conflict. He says it's not a conflict, but a coexistence mm-hmm. in the middle part. So he puts like two circles together. A Venn diagram. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> city man. And I just wrote in the middle circle, I just said present time. This is where we are. Mm-hmm. We live in this in-between tension. The state can remain in God's present order uh, because it possesses the knowledge of good and evil through common grace. God gives us that common grace to know what is good, what is evil. And that's why it remains until his final return. Um and so he kind of walks us through that. And, I, and I, I see that as a good reminder for us. How we live now is we look to the future, but we have both things right here and now. You know, I am waiting the full kingdom of God, but I'm already part of the kingdom of God. Which does give me some relief when I see elections, when I see when You wars. want to bang your head against the wall? I want to wall. bang my head against the wall, and I see interviews with people on both sides, and I'm like, people sound, they sound nutso. Like on both, I don't care which side you're on. You yeah. can find the nutso people; they're there. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and I, I hear bo- people who profess to be believers sound nutso mm-hmm. because they put so much trust on a political system or a thing instead of recognizing that you can be involved, you can vote, you know, with integrity, you can educate yourself. But Christ is King. 
I live in the fact that he already has won. Yeah. And whether things go my way in American politics or in the wars that are happening in the world, Christ is the one that's there, and that's what we're yearning for. Mm -hmm. And so we, mm -hmm. we live in that place. Um, he says, at the same time, the state has been confined uh, to this passing age. So no matter what, it's like there is a temporal sense to this. Uh, this, this, this too will pass. Right. I put, it will end. It will all, it, it will end. It will. You know, the, the, the people like, you know, like the Hitlers, um, like the, the modern totalitarian people, the, the people that are causing atrocities right now, all of that will end. We'll come to an end. The people who aren't causing atrocities, but they are just dealing all the shady deals to get all the money that they want and, and being corrupt in all different ways, even politicians, that will end. It will all come to an end. Um, and I'm not just talking about our country. It's all over the world. It's that way. Right. right. You know, um, and so it's an understanding that he says it ends because, and because of this, we proclaim that what, what's coming is a new way. Mm. And as I said uh, in a recent sermon, I said, so my hope is that more people would be, I guess I said at the table, because we're talking about communion at the time, mm -hmm. more people would be at the table, but in the sense, more people would join our political party. Which is, that means they claim Christ as Savior. I mean, that, <coughs> that would really be what, what makes it better, is more people are seeing that there's a new way coming. Right. That Christ is on his way here. Um, so that, that means, he says, subversion coincides mysteriously with submission. So we kind of watch how this goes on and what it does. Uh, we obey with the ultimate authority, and that's God himself. Mm -hmm. And we submit because we have a higher politic, and that's what the new kingdom is. So then he lays out that at the cross, all this kind of comes together. And he says, Jesus at the cross did both. He submitted and he subverted. So I'll just read, I'll read what it says, because he, he puts the two charts together and they make a cross. And he says, as you can see in the chart, Jesus willingly sacrificed himself because he held all the power. Yet, as a lowly Jew, he also yielded himself to the governing authorities and to their God-given power. At the very same time, it was his most subversive act. The greatest uh, Reformation movement began at the cross. His death was the key that changed the world. At the exact same time, the cross was the greatest critique of all tyrannical kingdoms, past, present, and future. It, it, and it holds all of this in, in tension. The cross, he says, with the new the arrival of the new king, that's already not yet. Like Here he is, here's the king. Mm -hmm. And what, what, where does he establish his kingdom? In death, which is a strange way to do it in a worldly sense. Paradox, yeah. And he says that cross is the center of our political theology. And so he says that we can do this subversion and submission together because we see it in the cross. But then it leads us to ask a question. And I love the question. He says, we must ask ourselves. And I answered, kind of underlined these. These are all questions that we had throughout the chapters. Mm -hmm. Am I privatizing my faith? Or, am I, or have I made my faith too partisan to a political party? That's one question. Uh, do I think of just nationalism or nonconformity? And we talked about those. Triumphalism or escapism? So we see all of those. Or, you know, utopianism or quietism. It kind of has a little chart of how all those are. And he shows how Jesus was none of those. He came, he carves his own path. And then he lays out, and this is, I know, a part where on the next chart, you get a little frustrated with the editing as well. He lays out a path of a lot of the religious parties in, in Jesus' Jewish world. Mm -hmm. Which, in some ways, was very helpful. Because very you helpful. hear these names and you think, what was that? Yeah. Where do they stand again? You know, you have the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Those the, are the, the easiest ones. The Essenes and, and the Zealots. Yes. The ones you hear about the least in Scripture are the Essenes. They're mm -hmm. because they, they decided to go live in caves. You know, and they, these were all reactions to the political system. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sadducees were the closest to accepting Roman power. The Pharisees worked within it, but they're a little more conservative of the power. Um, and and I, I would flip where he has these other two, but, you know, the, the Essenes, they wanted to get away from everything. They were separatists, so they went out, and that's where we found eventually the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I view them as, in America, like our modern-day Amish, or someone that, that's going to go live off-grid. I'm just... We'll live off grid, be away from everything. We have our own little community. We self survive over here, and we're waiting the kingdom. That's what they were doing, waiting the kingdom. And then the zealots who were like, "I will help bring the kingdom." These were the ones that the you hot know, heads. the hotheads, but the ones that also had attacked Rome and done other mm -hmm. things. 
And I know he says the Sadducees and Pharisees were more in the middle uh, of kind of this spectrum. Uh, but then when he puts the chart, he kind of has them on the on the ends. Just kind of, you know, right. I think it's just a matter of squeezing the graphic into the right place. Uh, and I get that part. But look at the chart. Even if you spread it out a little bit more, it does help you to see that there were at least four religious parties. There, there were more, but four major ones. And where they fit in pro-Roman and anti-Roman. Mm -hmm. And that Jesus, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought of this because... As a kid who just grew up, Jesus was against them all. or Against is probably not the right word, but that's how you grew up thinking, right? Sure. Jesus could have joined the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Essenes or, the, you know, or any party that was out there. He was a religious person mm -hmm. living that life, and he doesn't do that, uh, which is very interesting. Instead, what he does is to each one of those, he welcomes them into the new party. It says, uh, after the chart, it says the New Testament is a tour de force in critiquing all of these systems. Jesus was not a zealot, but he welcomed a zealot to, dis to disciple them. He was not a Pharisee, but he spoke to the Pharisees about the arrival of the kingdom. He was not an Essene, but his forerunner, uh, John the Baptist, was, who was, might have been like this group because he was off, showed him the way of compassion and care. Jesus did not work for Rome, but he embraced the tax collectors and proclaimed peace to them. So he was not anti-empire or pro-empire. He was alter-empire. Mm -hmm. He was for the new kingdom. How often do you read? Now when you go back and read the Gospels and he says, my kingdom has come, the kingdom's not here yet. Like You start re recognizing those are very stark political terms as much as they're also religious terms. Um, and so that's why I think sometimes we're like, how did these disciples not understand and they were like we we're waiting for this powerful king and he's going to take a bit well this is why his language was very political mm -hmm. and they did live in this split and he didn't join any of the other religious ones in the way they looked at politics mm -hmm. because they didn't separate him it was just more how they viewed it through their religious and his was nope a new kingdom is coming which he is king and it's totally different his aims were it says at the end of that section, says his aims were entirely political, but in a way that would surprise everybody. Mm -hmm. That's why his death surprised his followers. His time, I, you have to be present human being to to lead us, and he's on the cross dying. Right. That's why they're hiding away. Now the Romans are going to come after us because we were part of that political party, religious but political party. Um, and so he says. So, so they live in this tension because he brings in something completely new. Mm -hmm. His resurrection shows it that it's really upside down and different. Right. Well, yeah, and you look at the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. You have heard it said, but I tell you. Yeah. All the way through. And he attacks every system that's out there or critiques, might be a better word, and shows a new way, a different mm -hmm. way. Um, one of the ways to be truly political, as he says, is to speak more of God's reign. And that's one of the things that they did and that the early church did. Uh, they spoke more of the reign to come, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And I think even as modern day churches, we could do the same. It, he says, speak more of God's reign and thereby thereby you put Caesar's reign in its place. They did that and we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very staunch about not, not speaking politics, American politics from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Very much about God's reign. Um, and God's it's politics. God's politics. God's the king. We we are, and, and we may we can be proud of our nation and stuff. Sure. But we are, as believers, our nation is not a godly nation. You know, and because the godly nation is all of the believers, every ethnicity, every tribe, every tongue. It's not geographically bound. It's not ethnically bound. It is everybody. So you know, we can't just say our, geogra our geographical nation is going to be the godly nation. It doesn't even make biblical sense. You know? right. so, so what we promote most and in every way is the reign of God himself. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that do with modern politics? Uh, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative, all these ideas. Is It, it says they are less important. It actually removes their power and authority without having to go up against them. Right. And he said the New Testament authors did the same. Right. And that's why Rome saw Jesus as a political yeah. threat. Yeah, they did. They definitely did. And, and But they didn't see the church often as that threat because the church isn't out there critiquing Rome. Right. 
That's what he says the New Testament authors did. He said, if you count how many times the New Testament authors speak explicitly of Caesar, invoking his name, he said, it is quite rare. Mm -hmm. This clues into a reality. By not speaking much of their power, the authors of the New Testament regulate, uh, regulate their, relegate their, their power. So in other words, they don't talk about Caesar, it doesn't matter because he's just a bit player in all of this, and they see Christ as king. And it literally takes the power of Caesar and brings it all the way down to, to human level. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I just wrote in my note, because they know the real power is Christ. And if we were to live that, not just say, yeah, I believe in Christ, or I go to church and worship, but to live understanding that the real power is Christ, it would come out in our language, in the way we express our worries and fears at work or with our neighbors. Um, that's where it would come out. You know, so in the shadow of Rome, for the church, the most subversive way to act was not to oppose Rome. It was interesting. The church didn't actually oppose Rome, but they denied its principal significance. You are not as important to us. And that's how you handle a bully, right? <laughs> it's true. It's you ignore them because <laughs> if you don't give them power, they yeah. don't have it. Yes, you can. That's one way to definitely handle a bully and it, remove all power. I used to say that to somebody, I used to know some kids like, People would make fun of them or poke joke, make jokes with them. Maybe not always make fun of them, not bully wise, but like because that youth would react and over, ah, and then people would do more. And I right. said, why? So in teaching, my wife and I would say, hey, if you know, if you stop reacting, give it a couple times, they'll stop. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same idea. You know, Caesar is God. That's what he was saying himself. Rome is the ultimate power that will save you, and the church says we're just not going to talk about you because you're not worth it. You know, and I think it's the same here. Uh, the kingdom of God is what's the greater work that's at power. Um, Paul did not say, and I have to go back and look at this. Maybe you can. He never says outright, "Caesar is not Lord." Yeah, no, yeah. He only says, "Jesus is Lord." By making an affirmative statement, you you assume the negative statement. Yeah, you, you're implying that, and it's very clearly implied. That's all that needed. That's what I wrote down. That's all that needed to be said. Jesus is Lord. Christ is king. Who, who reigns over America? Christ. Who reigns over, you know, UK? Christ. Who reigns over, you, you, name a country. He That's is right. king over it all. And if believers would live that way, it would be different. And he says we need to learn from this tactic. And the tactic combines that removing of power by not speaking of it because Christ's power is greater. And when Jesus says to the people who bring him the coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God's what is God. Mm -hmm. So you work within it, but you're subverting because you point to the power that's above it. Yeah. Um, and he says we need to learn from it. And and we can't blame the systems out there. We can't blame, I like how he says, we can't blame the media anymore. And I know media is left and right. And I, I, I guarantee you, I used to do this a while back, and sometimes I still do it. In the morning, I listen to a very conservative station on, on the radio or on my satellite radio. And in the afternoon or when I'm driving home, I listen to very little. They're like literally opposite stations. And it's very funny, but they, they purport, both of them report themselves as news stations. Mm -hmm. But he says, we can't use that anymore because we're in the land of social media. We're in the land of all the phones and all the things. He says, we the people have become the media. So if we the people give politicians 24-hour coverage, then we endow them with the influence. Mm -hmm. What we are, are paying attention to, even on our phones... On our things is what you're giving power to. Yeah. Right, because the way in the way social media is set up now, the uh, algorithms. Yeah. The more you watch, the more it brings that in front of you, and the more yeah, it, yeah. it definitely does it. He says uh, he mentions a guy named Oliver O'Donovan, and I have not heard of this guy, but he says he said uh, that the business of the church is to refuse to worship the powers that be. We refuse to worship them not by feverishly responding to their actions. And that's something that people have asked me. I've had people, almost every church I've been in, including this one, have come up and, have you heard about this? You need to say something about this at the pulpit. Have you heard this agenda is going before the... As kindly as possible, I say it's not going to happen from the pulpit. <laughs> I'm not standing up there feverishly responding to the actions of the state. He says, this is the quote from Oliver O'Donovan, not every wave of political enthusiasm deserves the attention of the church in its liturgy. My purpose, and I say often our purpose of the church here is to promote Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, to promote that and his work. Like, that's what we are worshiping and how we do that together and walk in that. 
So he, then he says, the worship that, pr that the principalities and powers seek to exact from mankind is a kind of feverish excitement. There are many times when the most pointed political criticism imaginable is to talk about something else. And so I usually pick that something else to be Christ himself. <laughs> yeah. Nice, safe subject. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but it's also a dangerous subject. You know, uh, I, I said it I said it in a sermon. I said, you know, it's difficult when we speak the good news, the beginning of the good news is that we're all under the wrath of God. And that's usually where people don't want to hear it. Right. But how, until they know that, how do they know they need salvation? Right. And so it is part of that good news and the truth. You know, so the gospel, he says, is political but it's political in a way that no one expects. Because right. I, I, I even listened, I think today on, on the news, as I was coming into work, they were talking to some politician, and they were just critiquing the other person, critiquing this. And we're expected to do that with the world around us, but the gospel's political because we say, there is a better kingdom. I don't need to critique the world. There is a better kingdom. There is a better kingdom. Here it is, and it's the one to come. And it's already won, and it's already there, and it's going to come. So he says, uh, this goes all across the world, it's the same. He says, upon the shoulders of the government uh, uh, will rest, on, on, upon his shoulders the government will rest and only he'll, he will bring lasting peace. That's all on Christ. So he's going to bring the only lasting peace over any government that's out there, any social reform system or, or help or anything. Christ is the one that brings peace overall. And he says this, claiming Christ is king. That should be our political witness, our public witness. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, I mean, that is the crux of the book. And, and it has helped me in some sense to think of, I've even joked about this a little bit in church, our gathering as a political rallying point. Right. We rally for our, our, I wouldn't even say elected official, our, our king. Right. And we, the nice thing about this kingdom is he's not tyrannically taking over everybody. Right. Just inviting those who want to come and be a part of it. And, and that's different. Mm. Very different. Well, yeah. I think the biggest takeaway for me from this book is, yeah. is, you know, so ingrained. When you think politics, you think American political parties. Right. You don't think of kings or oligarchs or dictators. You don't right. think of that as no. politics. Mm. And so that has definitely broadened yeah. the way I think of things. In right. Right. I, I agree. I, I I have often said, you know, Christ is king, but I never thought of those words as, as a political, political statement. Right. And to view right. it, it actually has freed me to say, yeah, we're political. <laughs> we're political here in our church. Of course we are, because I claim Christ is king. And that is up against every type of government system out there, including the one I'm in now. Right. I recognize that as, as beautiful as a country we live in, with the freedoms of religions that we have and and the ability to vote, and uh, I recognize that Christ is better than that. He's more than that, so much more than all of that. Right. And so he's king over over that. And I recognize the government has its good places, and it has done good for many people. But even as we see there, there's when it goes outside of God's bounds and it becomes corrupt, it's not good. And and there are people God has charged, and I believe even believers to be involved in the political system, mm -hmm. to be politicians in our system or in other places, uh, to be social workers. Uh, none of this, I think, removes any believers from saying, I shouldn't be involved in American politics. Right. I think it just puts it in its appropriate place, it's which is much lower. Yes. Yes. So often it's become so high, or a certain agenda or a certain topic has become so high on the list. And it actually just puts it lower, right. where it belongs. Yes, and that concept of the more you pay attention to it, the more power you give it. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way, right. but that's true. It's true. So I guess we need to just let people know. I think the they want to comment all they want. But to end this is to recognize that if you claim Christ as king... You have a political duty, and that's to be one of his political rally people out there for him. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean he can't be involved. We live in this already not yet tension. We're waiting for him to come and, and establish his kingdom fully, and he will replace the city of man. I mean, this, won't, this will be no more. It will be a new heaven, 
a new earth, a new city of Jerusalem. It's all going to be new. Um, and we look forward to that. And so I encourage you, wherever you go this week, <laughs> to be political. I think I can say that. Yep. Yeah. As long as your idea of political fits this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be political. Yeah, where you in spend. In a heavenly minded kind of way. In a heavenly way. minded kind of Where you spend your time. Right. Your energy, your focus, maybe measure it out and see what weighs out the most. Um, and and hopefully it's Christ. If not, you can fix the balance and really focus on that. I think that should be our focus. Be the church, and and I think that actually is the, the change the world needs. So yeah. this isn't the end of along the road. Right. We have more to come. I will more things to talk more about. More things to talk about. I've been talking to one or two people to try and get some guests to join us, so hopefully we'll have that as well uh, uh, under different, different topics. So look forward to it. Until then, you have a wonderful week. Take care.